as the four steps of taking the good. The four steps that are involved in turning a useful, positive mental state into lasting neural structure. The first three steps are the standard steps. The fourth step is optional. I want to tr so can you see it up there? I'll do it kind of quickly. First step H, have the positive experience. You got to get the song playing. Usually because you notice it's already playing. You're with someone and it feels good with them. You're, or you're having an experience of accomplishment. Or you're, you just kind of have well-being. Or you're relaxing. You're exhaling and your body's relaxing as you exhale. Um, you're interested in something. You go outside and it's, it's pretty. Um, you eat a glazed donut. Don't let my wife hear this, but glazed donuts are awesome. Okay, <laughs> anyway. Um, so you're having a positive experience. Or you create it. You think of something you're grateful for, about. Or you bring to mind someone who cares about you, maybe loves you. Uh, you deliberately activate a positive experience. That's the first step. Second step, you enrich the experience. You get a lot of neurons firing, so they get a lot of neurons wiring. Minimally, you want to help the experience last. 5, 10, 20 seconds straight. All right? You can add to the enriching. You can get more of those neurons firing and wiring with four other factors that are well established in research on learning that help build structure in the brain. Intensity. So first is duration. That's the basic one. And then on top of that, if you want, as bonuses, help the experience be more intense. Right? That aids learning. Help the experience be multimodal. Feel it emotionally. Feel it in the body. Enact it, if that's appropriate. Sit up a little straighter to strengthen the sense of determination. Uh, let your face be softer if you want to really take in a sense of compassion. Maybe put your hand on your heart if you want to feel more loved. Okay? E for enriching. And the third step, A for absorbing, usually overlaps enriching in the actual practice. And it means simply that we are sensitizing, we are uh, priming in the terminology of psychology, we are priming memory systems so they become extra absorbent by intending and sensing that the experience is really sinking in. With children, I'll talk about uh, feeling that it's going into you like the warmth of a cup of cocoa in your hands, hot chocolate, you know, on a cold day, or putting a, ju a jewel uh, of the experience in the treasure chest of your heart. Uh, Adults, I'll use more abstract language like give yourself over to the experience, let it land inside you, let yourself be changed a little bit for the better by this experience. That's the absorbing step. That's the standard process of taking in the good. It's a little bit like, as a metaphor, a fire. Step one, we light the fire, get the good experience going. Step two, we enrich it by adding logs to the fire. Step three, we absorb it by letting this nice experience sink in. All right? And then, if we want to, and we're able to do this um, usefully without getting swept away, we help um, the positive experience heal negative material by linking to it, L for linking. In other words, since neurons are fired together, wired together, if we're aware of both positive and negative material simultaneously in the mind, and the positive is more powerful, it's more prominent, it's more intense, it's more in the foreground of awareness, it gradually infuses the negative. It goes into it. It starts associating with it, even to the point of gradually replacing it. So as the negative material goes back down the memory hole to be reconsolidated in structure, it takes some of those positive associations with it so that the next time it's reactivated, including as implicit memory, where we just have a funny feeling or we don't feel happy or there's a kind of sleepiness or an inhibition or a muzzling of us, whatever it is, or we go back to some old body postural pattern, um, the next time that negative material is activated, it'll bring back up with it some of those positive associations. All right. You want to try it? Well, I know. It's about time, right, Rick? Okay. Let's try it. So I'm going to go to the next slide if you want to look at it. We're going to do this two ways. We're just going to do first the noticing and then second the creating. Okay. So. First off, see if you can notice something pleasant in your experience right now. You're not creating something positive. You're just noticing something already positive. Now, it could be in the background of awareness, perhaps an ongoing sense of vitality in your body, or some basic background sense of well-being or connection, maybe connection to other people, perhaps in this room or elsewhere, 
Um, there could be a sense of just interest or curiosity in the mind. Whatever it is, maybe just a sense of appreciating um, good fortune. I'll be quiet in a moment. Bring this positive experience to the foreground of awareness so that you really have it. And see what it's like as a little experiment we'll do for about half a minute to just dwell in the positive experience. Sinking into it like a sponge, it's sinking into you like a sponge. You're staying with it, you're enriching it, you're helping it be bigger inside yourself, you're giving over to it, you're protecting it from other distractions, I'll be quiet in a moment, and you're helping it sink into yourself. Okay, so let that one kind of move to the background. We'll do another cycle here, going through the first three steps of taking in the good. In this case, I'm going to invite you to create a positive experience, and a particular positive experience. And let's see what happens. It's an experiment. This one is feeling cared about. So if you can, bring to mind someone, and it doesn't have to be a perfect relationship, that you know cares about you. Could be in your life today or in your past, could be a group of people or an individual, could be a pet, could be a spiritual being or force. So you're trying to now turn the idea, the knowledge that this person does care about you into an experience in the first step of having an experience of feeling cared about. And then once you get that fire lit, you're starting to actually have a feeling in your heart, a kind of a sense of emotion maybe, of feeling liked or appreciated or just seen or even simply included or certainly loved. Any one of those is the experience of feeling cared about or is under the heading of feeling cared about. Then second and third steps, enriching and absorbing, Help this experience of feeling cared about become more intense, help it last, and get a sense of it sinking into you, like water into a sponge. If you like, you can strengthen this experience in terms of multimodality by putting a hand on your heart or a hand on your cheek as if the most loving being in the universe was giving you compassion and kindness and love, feeling cared about. Okay. It's okay to keep feeling cared about. All right. It's really fine. It's one of the, as we'll see in a moment, really key positive experiences. So we did this little practice here. And as you can see in the slide, you're basically letting it sink into you. You know, if you were to summarize the whole verbiage, you know, from me today or in my book, Hardwiring Happiness, which is about this topic. It, it could be summarized in four words. Right? You don't need to buy the book. You really don't. Have it, enjoy it. Have it lights the fire. You're activating it. Enjoy it installs it in your brain. 10, 20, 30 seconds at a time, half a dozen times a day. Gradually filling up your own backpack with inner strengths. Okay. So 
How was that for you? Any questions or comments about that practice? And then I'm going to talk about how to apply it, including in clinical settings. It looked like it was working for you. Yeah. For most people, at least. Like you could stay with it. Sometimes it's like trying to light a fire with wet wood. You know, especially when you're trying to create a positive experience, you can't get it going. Or you get it going and it really quickly associates to something negative, like feeling not cared about or by the right person or in the right way. All right? That's very normal. And part of this practice is that it's a concentration practice a dozen seconds at a time. You're trying to become absorbed in the positive experience and protect it. You're trying to create sanctuary for it. And implicit in this practice is being on one's own side, being an ally to oneself, a friend to oneself, standing up for yourself, that you have the right, the opportunity to have a positive experience for 10 seconds in a row, right? At least that much, okay? So how can we use this method? So these are general methods, right? We have, we enrich, we absorb, and I'll soon get to, we can link if we want. That's the optional step. We can apply them to all kinds of things. We can apply this practice to thoughts, registering that you were a nerd, not a wimp, for example, okay? We can apply this to any kind of perceptual experience, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, and body sensations. We can apply these methods to really registering the shift in the body, let's say, in using you know, a nonce methods or related kinds of sensory motor learning. We can also use these methods have, enrich, absorb, to, for emotions, to really you know, let certain kinds of useful positive emotions sink in. Gratitude, joy, contentment, relief, right? peace, helping them sink in. Also, um, desires. Desires, broadly defined, wants, values, goals, wishes, um, purposes, even drives. That's very useful to let sink in. You know, a lot about life is, um, you know, the secret to life in a lot of ways is to help yourself learn to want the stuff that's good for you that you don't want, right? Because the stuff that we want, that's the easy. It's what we don't want, but we know is good for us. And I have a, my own personal list. Um, so how do we help that sink in? Well, we can do that too. We can help the experience of a wholesome desire sink in or help it sink in when there's a kind of reward when we've acted from that wholesome desire. So the brain is increasingly inclined toward that particular high road because it anticipates reward down that road. And then last, behaviors of various kinds, actions, inclinations. Uh, we can also help that sink in. All right? These are the targets of taking in the good. OK, so far? And then? OK? Yeah, you want to do the microphone willing? Great. Thanks for doing that. It's coming around the bend. Here you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm reflecting a lot about just, I've been here in the training for the last eight days with the APM and brilliant Annette and all yeah. of her assistants. And I've noticed how when I interact with people who don't know me, I'm able to just be myself when I don't have the stress of home or, yeah. <laughs> and so it feels really good. You yeah. know, you're, um, getting stories or, or connections with people that feel really good. Um, last night I had some not so great conversations with my hubby. Yeah. And um, I could just really feel how that decompon like. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Did you want to say I more about that? I wasn't trying to be emotional, but. but <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I think of that been, honestly as a gift to all of us. But it's Your like, willingness to go there and it implies a respect for others and a sense of the safety. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And when you I keep just going. feel like the importance of it, you know, to really be in that positive space. And how do you develop good communication skills with your partner right. to keep that positivity going? Because you know, when you're first in love and you're sharing in this way and it's great and bliss, and then all of a sudden life happens and. Yeah. So that would be my question to you. How do you keep that? Oh, thank spark. you for saying that <laughs> and bringing it up. So. Um, that's great. Thank you. Well, for me, first step is just to feel the weight of the other person. You know, whether it's your partner, your husband, you right now, just kind of 
Yeah. I mean, how often do we give people the gift of letting them land for at least a few seconds in our heart? That's just really important. And um, more broadly, I'll say a few things that I think are relevant here. Um, one is to really try to help yourself register in a relationship when your partner's not a jerk. <laughs> in other words, to really help it land when your partner is, in mild ways, attentive, loads the dishwasher properly, um, you know, uh, is, doesn't interrupt, doesn't act like a fool, whatever, is kind, is warm, is touching, is affectionate, um, you know, pays the bills, comes home on time for dinner, what have you. You know, try to let it land because, again, with the negativity bias, especially as relationships go by, we're very distracted. It's so easy to miss many of the little good things that our partner's doing every day that we become habituated to in terms of the brain, and we kind of don't notice them anymore. They become like the background refrigerator hum. We don't hear it, right? And think how, how much of it, it feels good to us as a kind of gift to us. Um, when others notice our everyday contributions, just even just a few of them, notice how that feels. Imagine what a gift that is to the other person. This is particularly important when we're trying to re-knit, re-knit, let's say, a fabric of a relationship that's gotten tattered, whether it's an intimate relationship or siblings or any other kind of relationship. And then it's really important to let it land when the other person is actually trying their best to meet your need, at least in some way, and not immediately, as I've seen a lot as a couples counselor, immediately snatch you know, defeat from the jaws of victory, in a sense, by doubling down on our complaint or going after the next thing rather than letting this one really land. So I think these methods, I actually have a slide about this that I didn't put up here because this is not a heavy therapist group, but about how to use this with couples or in our own relationship. So for me, it's really letting the good stuff land, right? That's, that's a really important thing. Second, by repeatedly taking in resource experiences of different kinds, and I'm actually going to get to some special kinds that have special impact, right? Um, by repeatedly taking in these good experiences, we become more stable when our partner is being with us in a way that we don't particularly like, right? We get less affected by it, and we're more able to stay centered and stay in the interaction, playing with inbounds, and still speaking truth to power, still saying what needs to be said, or recognizing that, you know, it's a phone call, I'm far away, you know, they're dealing with all kinds of stuff. 10,000 causes upstream are causing their bad moment, and I'm probably more of a bit player in their bad day than really the cause of it. And I don't really need to get into this right now to be restrained. So we have to can decide which is which. We don't know. But practicing off the field, as it were, and building muscles in, in the brain, in effect, metaphorically speaking, and building up experiences of feeling loved, feeling worthy, feeling valuable, feeling like we have rights of our own, right? Feeling that it's possible to fences make for good neighbors, I think, as I said, that you know, I can be here with you and not necessarily feel implicated in your mind stream without rejecting your mind stream. I can be in that balanced place where I'm very open to you while staying centered in my own seat, you know. So we take in lots and lots of experiences like that off stage, as it were, or in the locker room or whatever. And then when, whoo, you know, are you kidding me? You know, the oatmeal starts to fly. We've built up capacities to be more resilient. We have more shock absorbers inside ourselves, you know, and, and so forth. So I would say that. Um, and to appreciate, too, that a lot of what we can help land are often subtle lessons where, like, the capacity to, to register and recognize the suffering in other people. I'm getting teary. Um, that is also a resource experience to take in, to be able to stay with that and see that and realize, you know, a lot of what's coming out my way, which I don't approve of, every bit of it, for sure, and we're going to talk about this later. I have a little list I'm developing right now. I'm not waving my rights. But in the, there you are. But in the moment, in the moment, I can register that, you know, you're suffering, and that's a lot of what's happening here. And 
that capacity to see suffering in others, right, without being swallowed up by it, that too is a really powerful and beautiful thing we can take in. Good job. Okay. So let me segue off of that. I probably need that pretty soon myself. But I want to talk about different kinds of, that's OK. No, I'm good. I'm good to go. I'll tough it out. You know, um, uh, Different kinds of experiences have different kinds of value, right? So we want to take in good experiences. I already went through different categories, right? Thoughts, um, perceptual experiences, emotions, desires, and behaviors. We can take that in. And this is a way to think about what will help our clients, our students, our kids, our mates, our spouse, you know, what have you. But also, if you look up there, if you think about it, and I developed this model in my book a lot, and also at my website, I have tons of stuff freely offered. We have basically three needs, safety, satisfaction, connection. We therefore have three overarching motivational regulatory systems in our brain to avoid harms, to approach rewards, and to attach to others. These systems are very loosely associated with the reptilian, mammalian, and primate human stages of evolution. You know, avoid harms, approach rewards, attach to others. Or as I like to think about it, pet the lizard, feed the mouse, hug the monkey. All right? Okay. In a nutshell. All right, so if you look up there, you can see that certain kinds of issues have other things. Like right here, if I could just play with this as an example, if we have an issue in the attaching to others system, there's been some kind of breach of rapport or you know, empathic attunement doesn't seem like it's really happening here. Now, if I said to you, think of something you're grateful for, that's the approaching reward system, that probably wouldn't help the ache in the heart. Also, if I said, maybe think about some ways that you're strong or safe, that wouldn't really address the ache in the heart. If we have scurvy, in effect, we need vitamin C. Iron will not help. But if we have anemia, we need iron. In other words, we, um, we typically benefit from key experiences that are antidotes, that are targeted at our particular issues. So we could ask ourselves these four questions, which I just think are really valuable, and I use them. First question is, what's the problem? In other words, what's the issue? What's the nature of the condition? What's going on here? What's happening? Second, uh, what if it were more present in my mind would really help? What if it were more present in the mind of fill in the blank? My client, my child, my student, my, myself would really help. That's the second question. What's the key antidote experience? What's the resource experience that would make a difference at this point or at this stage in the growth process? Third question, how could I have an experience of that? How could I experience it? Because we build neural traits by activating the mental states. We record the songs by playing them. How could I have an experience of that inner resource that would make a difference? That's the answer to the second question. And then the fourth question is, once I'm having the experience, how can I help it sink in rather than just wasting it on my brain? Right? See those four questions? I think they're really helpful. And you might think to yourself, these days, what's your vitamin C? You know, for me, a little quick story here, growing up, like I said, you know, king of the dorks, I landed in college and I felt like I had inside me a hole in my heart. I had not received the normal um, supplies uh, of feeling included, valued, and wanted. Okay? Nothing horrible happened to me. My issues were trivial compared to that of so many other people. All right? That said, causes have effects. I didn't really get what, I norm, what, a normal, what, it, what we normally need, and so I had a hole in my heart. I tried to solve that problem by accomplishing things in terms of the approaching reward system. That didn't help me feel better deep down inside because that wasn't the medicine I needed. Right? I tried to help myself feel better by being determined, by being strong, right? by be, you know, being stubborn, sticking up for myself. That's in the avoiding harm system. That didn't. That wasn't the medicine I needed. Right? What I needed, and I finally discovered this early in college, um, was I needed to internalize again and again and again experiences in the attaching to other system of feeling included, wanted, appreciated, liked. A girl smiled at me in the elevator. Oh my God, you know, a guy throws the football to me in a mural ball. Good catch, Hanson. I'm going to throw to you more. Oh my God, 
you know, people say, hey, let's go to pizza. Great. Hey, Rick, you want to sit with us? Oh, yeah, please. Anyway, I was like a little sponge. Feed me, Seymour. You know, take it in, because I wanted to feel that. Now, some of that I did foolishly, but a lot. I knew inside myself this was my medicine. This is what I needed. You know, this was my vitamin C, right? So what's your vitamin C? What's your key resource experience? What would make a difference if it were more in your heart? Feeling stronger, feeling um, less anxious, what would help you feel less anxious? Feeling less frustrated or disappointed, less sense of loss, what would give you more of a sense of, of, a, of rewards coming into you? Or for many of us, you know, what would help you feel more cared about, more included, more seen, more appreciated, more valued, more loved? And then when you're clear, what's your vitamin C? In this you know, perfectly imperfect world, you can look for those opportunities to have that ex those experiences throughout your day. Two, three, four, five times a day, half a minute, a minute at a time, or less, but brick by brick, drop by drop, you can fill the hole in your heart. So any comments or questions about this point so far? Do I hear a little baby in the room? That's great. OK. Yeah? Yeah? OK, I'm going to keep going, right? And I'll stick around if you like afterward, OK? So yeah, I'm going to go for it. All right, on demand, if you like, let's try this idea of a vitamin C experience, your key resource experience. Now, you don't need to know the right one. And feeling cared about is the universal medicine. Because feeling cared about meets our needs in the attaching system. It's also rewarding. And it helps us feel safe because as we evolved in the Serengeti, exile was a death sentence. We want to feel that we're with other people. And there are many aspects of feeling cared about. So if you don't know which one to do, you can always do feeling cared about. All right, if you can right now, give yourself a little thought, um, give a little thought to what would be a key resource experience for me? What would make a difference for me if it were more present in my mind? And it's OK to we just think about something kind of a subtle spiritual thing you're working with these days, or maybe a, a little if you felt more confident, or frankly, less preoccupied with what other people think of you. You know, kind of what's it feel like to let that go? Uh, or maybe just gratitude or recognizing where you actually are accomplished. So I'll be quiet as you have this experience as best you can. Try to create it in yourself. Thinking of things that would kindle it in your mind. Try to get the fire of this key resource experience going. And then in the second and third steps, as you start having it, help it sink in. Help it last. If your mind wanders, come back to it. Keep trying to help it be embodied, emotional. And sense it going down into you, down into places perhaps that have really longed for this experience. Be a friend to yourself. Let yourself receive this experience. OK. Come on back. That was a stretch. I didn't know how that would go, but it seemed like it went OK for at least some people. Um, once we get the experience going, once we get the song going, the recording apparatus in the brain doesn't know who got the song playing. See? Once we get this activated, we can start installing it in our brain, even though we self-activated it. And frankly, being able to self-activate a useful mental state is foundational to coping, resilience, 
um, and everyday well-being, and even spiritual practice. Okay? So any comments or questions about this idea so far? All right. I think this is okay that you're okay. I'm just kind of read the vibes here. You know, different groups like New York. I've been there quite often. They're like, hands up. What do you do? Anyway, yeah, please. Okay. Um, can you? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Can you comment um, on the usefulness or otherwise of um, euphoric fantasies? Sure. Okay. Great. So, what might be the uses and mis misuses? of euphoric fantasies. Um, most positive experiences are good for us. And it's interesting, again, I, I did a deep dive into evolution you know, to do this book. Mother Nature wants us to feel good because it's good for us. And unpleasant experiences feel bad because they're bad for us from a survival standpoint. You know? So most positive experiences tend to be they're good for us. The problem is, and I might as well do this part right now, even though I was going to do it at the very end. <clears throat> we have a brain that evolved to want what it likes. And to the extent that the 2,500-year-old uh, Buddhist psychological analysis of the causes of our suffering is accurate, that drivenness, pressure, um, resisting, grabbing, clinging, clutching, to the extent that those, under the general broad umbrella term of craving, lead to a lot, if not most of, our suffering and harm. To the extent that that's true, the trick naturally, the question naturally is, how do we do this thing that I'm talking about, where we help positive experiences actually come into us, and we pop open the bottleneck in the brain so they can sink down inside? How do we do that without falling without f tipping over into the dark side of the force, as it were, into clinging or craving or just getting, you know, ignoring the negative, you know, just kind of getting lost in some lotus eater realm of the positive. How do we actually do that? It's a very real issue, especially for someone like me that teaches Buddhism. You know, I have to kind of like think about this, right? And the trick is to enjoy it without getting attached to it. The trick in your own experience is to feel very intimate with your own body, to come down into your body, to really experience it, to let it in, right? while simultaneously letting go. So it's like your, your mind, the way I visualize it myself, in the razor thin slice of time that is now, as time streams through us, or we stream through time, as time streams through us, um, I do it like this, like the future's out there, the past is like here. You know, through the net, as it streams through experientially, I try to have a sticky net, letting the good stuff stick, and otherwise letting it go, while momentarily receiving the next useful experience. And that's kind of the art of it. Now, um, it's okay to want certain things that are wholesome. But if we get too lost in our euphoric fantasies and people can go down some troubling roads there, you know, in various ways. Uh, my wife and I are starting to watch the TV show Breaking Bad. You know, we're about five episodes in. Don't tell us anything. Please. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But, uh, you know, you can get really lost in that and other kinds of fantasies as well. Uh, but one very powerful use of fantasy, very specific, is to imagine good caregiving that you never will have had. You're not deluding yourself about what really happened. Out of kindness to yourself and a very hard-headed, clear-eyed recognition of the vulnerability of the brain, especially in a child, to negative experiences. Um, and out of motivated benevolence toward yourself, the one being among all beings you have the most power over and therefore the highest duty to. Um, out of that, you might, if it works for you, and I've known people for whom this has been very, very helpful, me included in some ways, um, you call to mind a very rich experience of a kind of nurturing that you never really got and you never will have had, right? And yet you call upon your own nurturing qualities or a sense of other people in adulthood who are good, good with you, and to just feel that um, sinking into those young places inside that were mistreated or neglected or both. 
So that's one way to have fantasy be really quite powerful for people. And it's, if it's okay in terms of our time frames here, it's a good transition to the next point I want to make about how to do the L step, the linking of positive and negative. Okay? Go there. And I should add, I have a lot of material about this on my website, very freely offered, raykansonson.net. And you can go to the slide sets, the PowerPoint slide sets, and I'll also send these to you if you can give me your name and email address. Um, you can go to the PowerPoint slide sets where I'll do a whole day long workshop on this for therapists, for example, with a lot of detail, including a lot of stuff about kids. So I'm going to do a few more points, and then we're going to do the link thing. So it's good to take in the good. Trust me. It's good to take in the good. I think you've seen what it's like to take in the good. There's a nice quote here from Lao Tzu. Um, how does he put it? Keep a green bough in your heart, and a singing bird will come. Right. It's kind of nice. Now, how do we use this with others? How might we use this with our students, with our children, uh, patients, clients, whatever? If you look up there, you'll see that uh, we can offer taking in the good to others just like we do anything with other people. One, we can do it implicitly. We can just take them through it without making a big deal about it. Like someone, for example, is shifting their body in a useful way or registering a useful attitude or you know, getting a positive feeling. We can just say it's things like, yeah, isn't that nice, this sense of warmth between us? Or yeah, that sense of stability in your body now. Yeah, stability. We're just keeping, their, we're just keeping that fire going. We're just keeping those neurons firing so they wire. We're trying to get past the critical mass phase, that threshold, roughly 10, 20 seconds, where it actually starts converting and encoding into neural structure. Below that threshold, especially with a brain that's not yet sensitized to the good, you know, it's nice, but it doesn't make much difference, if any, at all. Okay? So that's the first way. The second is we teach people the method, and we let them do it on their own if they will. This is very good for teenagers who are very prickly about autonomy, um, some of these other people, or maybe it's just appropriate. We name it, we say, by the way, brains like Velcro for bad, Teflon for good, or however we talk about it. If you want to help your brain learn the good stuff, there's some standard methods that work really well. They're supported by research. You have to have a positive experience, and then help it last, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds in a row. And even since it's sinking in. See what happens if you try that. That's the second way. We name it explicitly, and we leave it to them. Third, we explicitly take people through it. We say, okay, you're having that good experience, that stability in your body, that sense of gratitude, the feeling of being loved. Let's really go with this. Let's stay with it. You know, maybe I'll just kind of talk you through it. Or I'll be quiet while you do this yourself because you know how to do it. And I won't stare at you while you're doing this. All right? um, that's the third way. And the fourth, we teach it explicitly. And then we encourage people to do it out in the real world, outside our office, and sometimes even tell us about what happened or even give them a little checklist about it. OK? Four ways to do this with other people. All right. And then I want to talk about children. Good. So all kids, in my experience, benefit from taking in the good. Why not? We want to help them learn good emotional learning. We want to help them get more good stuff in their backpack as they go down the road in life. Children at either end of the temperamental spectrum, you know, serious turtles or serious jackrabbits really benefit because turtles tend to be anxiously preoccupied and they're afraid that if they feel good, they'll lower their guard and something bad will happen, right? Same as anxious adults. And then jackrabbits, maybe you're kind of positive, wee, but the next thing, the next good thing is happening one after the other so quickly that there's no opportunity for it to sink down from short-term memory buffers in the long-term storage. Plus, jackrabbits going to turtle pen schools get you know, banged on many times a day you know, in terms of negative experiences. So they need it especially as well. Um, kids register positive experiences faster than grown-ups do. Um, so we don't need to take the time with them. By the way, in this setting, I'm kind of unpacking these methods, right? But in real life, have it, enjoy it. You know, We just kind of flow along. We're feeling good. There's a nice moment with our partner. We got some emails done. We put the kids to bed finally. <sighs> Let it sink in. And we give ourselves that good experience 10, 20, 30 seconds in a row, just in the flow of life, in a kind of intuitive way. Right? <clears throat> On the other hand, when we learn anything new, it helps to kind of unpack it and highlight different parts to it. Okay? So with kids, it happens pretty quickly. 
And then the last thing I'll say, a little practice, is to go after vitamin C experiences with kids, both in general and also just before bed. You know, kids roughly 3 to 13, 3 to 10, 3 to 12, who will put up a psychobabble, you know, to prolong their bedtime. Right? So you can kind of talk with them about a good thing that happened in the day, kind of have that positive experience, get it going, light that fire. And then once it's going, yeah, isn't that nice, kind of sinking in. That's a real keeper, isn't it, sweetie? You know, put that one in the treasure chest of your heart. I've seen that that little practice, just before bed, has surprising impact. Part of it, of course, is because mom or dad is actually giving you special attention. You know, that matters. It's nonspecific. Okay. But in addition to that, you're getting the benefit of really taking in the key experience. And I've just seen that have a really, really big impact. I should use it as a way to also say that for me, there are three kinds of benefits in taking in the good. One is the specific flowers we grow in the garden of the brain, the garden of the mind-brain system, the particular resource, whether it's a child or an adult, that is taken in. Second, what's implicit in the act of taking in the good. You've got to get on your own side to take in the good. You've got to treat yourself like you matter, which is really important if you haven't felt like you've mattered enough to other people. You're also being active rather than passive, you know, a cue ball instead of an eight ball, and you're training attention. Because to do this, it's not always so easy. And um, the third type of general benefit in taking in the good is to sensitize the brain to the positive, to actually make it spongier to the positive over time. So you get faster and faster, and it's easier and easier to turn everyday positive experiences into lasting um, inner strengths inside your brain. Mm -hmm. Now I want to talk about the L step, and then we're going to wrap it up. And I'll stick around and happily answer questions or just kind of hang out. All right? So the link step. Yeah. Microphone. Thanks for putting up with it. It's coming. Thank you, our runners. That's great. Thank you, our runner. I haven't heard anything about like journaling or writing it down. Yeah. A lot of us like to do that. Is that yeah. useful for you know holding on to this? Yeah, is journaling useful? I think journaling is very useful in terms of activating a positive experience and then helping it be rich. The question, of course, is when we're journaling or otherwise really using language, are we mainly up here with the thought track? and not that richly engaged with the emotion track or the sensation track? That's the only question. So if we're doing a journaling process and along the way bringing mindful awareness to the sense in the body of what we're writing about, you know, and we're helping ideas become experiences, you know, menus become meals, as it were, right? Then I think it's a very powerful method. And there are lots of other ways to cultivate positive experiences. Sharing about something good with other people. That's a great one. Uh, reminiscing about the past, that's a great one. Creating the basis for a good experience, right? Uh, working in the garden deliberately to start having that experience, and then not wasting it on your brain, helping it sink in. I really want to talk about linking, OK? And to do this, um, I think just in the interest of time and respecting people's uh, time here, I'm just going to name it and tell you how to do it. Be a little careful because this involves negative material as well as positive material. Everything before was positive, even if some of the intention behind it was to address needs. But in the fourth step, you're actually also aware of negative material. And it's important to not get sucked into it or hijacked by it. All right? So if you take a look at the slide, and it builds on this idea of antidote experiences, certain forms of old pain or current pain are really addressed by certain kinds of positive experiences. For example, if you have felt weak or helpless, maybe things happened when you were young or you're in a situation where you feel helpless, antidote experiences are things like a sense of being strong, feeling like you can cope, or that, at least in some other parts of your life, you're able to really make things happen. See that idea? So you might ask yourself, like I did, OK, I had that hole in my heart where I didn't feel loved enough, included enough, wanted enough. Right? Experiences of feeling wanted, feeling included, feeling loved were really, really good for me. So the way you do this fourth step is you for sure have that positive experience. You want it to be prominent. 
And in the beginning, it's a little funny to divide awareness to include both positive and negative in awareness. But with practice, you can really do this. So you're mostly centered in the positive experience while having a sense of it connecting with or going into those hurt or wounded or neglected places inside. All right? Um, and if you often, if you want to do this, you could get a sense that the current positive experience is connecting with younger parts of yourself. And they are actually receiving it. And it's going into them. Be careful if you do this with traumatic material. Uh, as my friend Linda Graham has pointed out to me, many standard therapies involve the linking step. To be clear, I did not invent any part of taking in the good. It's natural to take in the good, and it's natural to link positive and negative. What I have tried to do is explicate it carefully and ground it in some kind of framework of evolutionary neuropsychology. But we know how to take in the good. It's not rocket science. Have it, enjoy it. You know, we're, we're especially good at have it. Where the real money is, is installation, enjoying it. So, you know, if you're on your own, I would say probably not a good idea to try to send the positive experience into the center of the trauma. Right? On the other hand, with a skilled therapist, you might find a lot of value in doing that or using the positive to connect with issues kind of around the core of the trauma, like the sense of being let down by failed protectors who really should have stuck up for you more. All right. And in more general terms, whether you're feeling anxious these days or, or kind of mopey or uh, not loved enough or not uh, worthy enough, there are many opportunities to deliberately activate positive experiences and then let them link to and connect to negative material holding both of them in your mind at the same time. Okay? That's basically the linking step. And you're very welcome to do that on your own. I think it's, for me, it's definitely top five, for me, psychological methods of anything I've ever learned, including in spiritual traditions. And you can use this linking method for spiritual practice as well. Okay? So I kind of want to move to a wrap here, respecting time. So I want to just uh, give you a little quote at the very end here, uh, which I'll pop up there. You can read it as well. And some of that other stuff, if you want, just give me your name and email address on the other slides. You know, what I think is really interesting, to go back to the two wolves in the heart, which wolf are we going to feed, right, day after day? And lately, this thought has come to me, which is, what's the most important minute in your life? What's the most important minute in your life? It's this one. You got it. It's the next one. We can't do anything about the past. More than a minute or two or three out, our influence really starts to fade. But the next minute is the most important minute of our life. What will we do with this minute? In the next minute of our life, which wolf will we feed? Knowing that, the brain has a negativity bias, and it learns very, very quickly and all too well, and it really holds on to that learning from negative experiences. Can we feed the wolf of love? Can we help the good things grow inside ourselves? And to me, it's very powerful to appreciate that this method is practical, and it's grounded in science, and we earn it. We have to do the work, right? We can't just la 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 our way through life. We have to do what we can to have these positive experiences, and then especially help them sink in. That's where we earn the fruits. But if we do that, day after day, it's the law of little things things will really change. And as you see up there in the quote, you know, this is from the Buddha, he says, think not lightly of good, saying, it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one fills oneself with good. So I really wish you well in filling yourself with good, and as much research shows, as our own cup or pot runneth over, we start having a lot more to offer other people as well, helping the world become a better place. So, thank you. Thank you. I even have a pretty picture, see? Kids. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. Okay. You. My thank pleasure. You. Sound? Sound? Yeah, you got the sound? Thank you so, so very much. Wonderful, wonderful. I love it. I can see the room. I mean, people were crying. 
stuff, <laughs> going through deep experiences. Anyway, um, so again, uh, I, as I said, we don't have the actual book. He said, don't, you don't have to buy it. I th <laughs> don't believe him on that part. And, uh, but but it w you can put your name in the back so you can get the slides and you can get on Rick's everything. And um, that's about it. And Rick, you're going to hang out for a little yeah. bit? Really? Yeah. Okay, so Rick is just going to be here if you guys want to talk to him. And uh, I was trying to make up a way that you can sign their books once they buy it, but I don't know how to do that, so we'll forget that part. <laughs> thank you very, very much. And, I, you know, I do want to thank Mike. Where's Mike? Mike Davis, is he around? He's probably going to run in from the office. And uh, Carol, here's Mike. Um, I mean, these people just put a lot of work. Come on, Mike. Mike. And Jason and Carol, Carol. I mean, these are all people in the training. They're, you know, they're part of my staff. And, and all of you guys that are in the training that just vacuumed and put the chairs and just turned this room into a, a presentation hall very quickly. Come on, come on. Because I really, I want to thank you. And you come here, our flower arranger. Yes, come on, come on, come on, come on, flower arranger. And the students that have helped. Come on, stand up. Then let's recognize you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're adorable. Okay. All right. Here we go.